stupendous PowerPoint of vision. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about um, really uh, the talk version of the exhibition that I gave yesterday in the uh, public engagement event. This idea of monsterizing prehistory, monsterizing paleo art in particular, because obviously I guess that's one of my, my main interests as a, the, as a paleo artist myself. Um, I think this is something that we're all broadly familiar with. I think we're, if we talk about the concept of, of monsters uh, in, uh, sorry, monsterizing dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals, we all intuitively know what, what, we're, what we're talking about here, but I think it's a good idea. Oh, sorry, before I dive into this, I just want to say we have this, this is really for the folks watching at home in, uh, over there out in internet land. Um, when we talk about monsters, it's often taken as a criticism of paleo art in particular. So I just want to give a, a bit of a disclaimer. This is not to criticize anyone's work. If, if your favorite artist is included in this talk, do not take offense. It's just to, we, we need to talk about this stuff. If, if, if paleo art is going to have any sort of scholarly backbone, we need to be able to talk about its various facets. So this is a discussion of monsterization. It's not a, it's not a critique of it. It's not casting judgment. Just, uh, just want to make that clear before we will get to meet hate emails and that sort of thing. So as I was saying, I want to go, uh, come up with a bit of a, uh, a firm definition for what I consider to be monsterization in paleo art. Your mileage on this may, may differ, but I think what we mean by monsterization is restoring extinct animals in a way where we augment aspects of their anatomy and their behavior in a way that makes them appear more ferocious, more terrible, uh, and more intimidating than they possibly were. You know, we're going beyond what the fossil record suggests um, you know, would be a, a realistic amount of, of, uh, of terribleness in these creatures. I'm sure there were plenty of prehistoric animals that we would not want to meet. I'm sure there are plenty of things that would definitely try and eat us uh, and all this sort of stuff. I'm not denying that, but we, we go further than that and we kind of give them this, this monstrous quality. So this is what we do. And I think what, what we achieve with this is we sort of augment these creatures. We kind of propel them beyond being realistic animals and we push them into this almost mythological realm where they're they're more fantastic they're more sort of I'm going to use the phrase super animals uh, several times in this talk we kind of push them beyond that and, and really I, I think what we're, we're augmenting here are, are physical characteristics that's what we're looking for we're looking for those uh, attributes that, that really enhance the um, you know just just the, the, the awfulness of this thing so they, we really try and make them look like creatures that we would never want to meet in real life and I think the way we can demonstrate that is by looking at pictures by two different artists of basically the same thing. And we look at one which I hope is a more naturalistic take on an animal, and we look at one which you could consider to be monsterized. And I think just comparing these two things, as I say, these are very, very similar pictures, and yet you can see how one is hopefully feels like something you could see in life, and the other one looks like a very augmented version of what these animals uh, were like. And there's a few things that I think really bring out the, the, the monsterized um, take on, on this animal. Think about things like the, uh, the dominance of the animal in this scene here. So in the scene on the left, the animal is pushed right the way back into the middle distance. In the scene on the right, we have the animal very dominant. It's, it's really close to us. You know, it's something that is physically close. It's a threat to us because it is that near. We have the, um, look at the posture that is being used here. Both these animals have aspects of their anatomy which are in quite high articulation. They're close to the end of the range of motion, but in this, image on the right, everything is close to its extreme of motion. So the flippers are probably up a little bit too high, to be honest. Uh, the fore flippers are, the, the back flippers are down quite low. Um, the neck is sinuous, it's actually bending around, probably far more than it actually could in life. The jaws, of course, are almost hyperextended. Um, this is a very extreme pose as a way of, of making this animal look really, really animated. You know, it's, it's really coming, uh, really coming for us. The way the animal kind of pops out of the scene here, so we actually have these other creatures in the back. This is a slightly kind of stylized take on this animal, I suppose, but this really pops out. This is really, we are drawn to this animal in this scene on the left. It's kind of part of this, it's part of its environment. It has the same sort of color palette. It is part of a, part of a scene. And there are lots of other ways that we can, we can characterize this. There are lots of points we could go through. Um, one thing that I, I haven't mentioned that I probably should have is the real emphasis on things like the jaws. Your attention is drawn towards the jaws of this animal. They're drawn towards the, um, the articulations and the limb. It shows how much it's moving and how quickly it's going, not so much in the picture on the left. And this extends to other types of paleo art as well. And I think when we think of monsterization, we might think, oh, there's always these scenes of violence in paleo art. And what I want to say to you here is that you can have a scene which threatens violence 
and yet doesn't feel monsterized. And I think you can see, too, these pictures are near identical in composition, and yet John's picture on the left it feels like a very natural scene. I, I, I feel that there is, uh, you know, this is um, a predatory scene. The ostrich dinosaurs, the, the animals being predated on, they are clearly running for their lives. There, there, is, there is danger in this scene. But look at the way the Tyrannosaur is painted here. You can see the teeth, but it's worth noticing you can only see the teeth really on the inside of the mouth because the lips cover most of those teeth. So John is really hiding most of the dental anatomy here. Contrast that with Todd Marshall's picture. This is me Megalosaurus on the right-hand side. The teeth here are really prominent. We've even got spittle falling down from this animal as it, as it, as it pulls forward. It's really interesting just contrasting these different scenes because it's, uh, as I say, similar composition, but the way it's been approached is in entirely different. The attention here is really drawn towards features like the claws, the teeth. Look at the, the muscularity in the legs. Look at the size of the feet. These are all physical features that we're enhancing to, to really make you think, wow, what a powerful, fast, aggressive, powerful animal this was. But, and this is, you know, when I say you don't get that from John's, this is not a criticism at all. This, to me, looks like a restored theropod dinosaur. This, to me, looks like a restored theropod dinosaur plus plus. It's got, you know, we've, we've taken features, we've added spikes. We've got this kind of shrink wrappingness going on with the shoulder blades there. It's, it's very, very... Um, you know, it, it, it's very monsterized in, in that sense. And again, I'm just going to run through these, make sure I haven't missed anything. I think that's, that's pretty much it. So we can go through those points there, and there are lots of ways that you can contrast, even very similar, even a violent scene, sorry, and, uh, and they, they, you know, they, they come out as uh, having non-monsterized versions and monsterized versions. The, the, the work we've just looked at has been quite intentional. The monsterized versions we've looked at, they're, they're obviously what the artist is going for. It's worth considering times when we have monsterized animals accidentally as well. This is stuff that we haven't been going out of our way to do, but it's just been the, been the convention of paleo artistry at the time. And I can think of no better example of this than what we call shrink wrapping. So this is the convention of where we restore fossil animals with bare minimum soft tissue. So we can really see all the features of the, of the skeletal anatomy, it's, uh, it's really obvious, it's showing through the musculature, it's showing through the skin. So this is one of my paintings where I've tried to contrast these two different reconstruction approaches. These are both the same species of sauropod dinosaur, it's just that one of them has what we might consider, hopefully consider, to be a realistic amount of soft tissue on its face, and the other one has this kind of shrink wrapped convention. And I don't think we can honestly say that the, the guy on the top left there, he doesn't look like a particularly realistic animal. He looks emaciated, he looks zombified. These are all terms that we could apply to, to shrink wrapped animals. So, but this is, you know, for, for several decades, this is how we've been restoring these things. And it's just because that's how we thought, you know, we thought we were doing the right thing, but in, in hindsight, maybe not. Maybe we were barking up the wrong tree with that. Other ways where we make uh, reconstruction mistakes are things like the prominence of teeth. So paleo artists do like to show teeth a lot. I think there's a, there's a lot of research being done at the minute, or certainly a lot of discussion, maybe not much research, but certainly lots of discussion about the prominence of teeth in paleo art. Do dinosaurs is a pretty pretty hot debate if you want to get into uh, get into that. Um, but the same for things like uh, fossil mammals. You'd have thought fossil mammals. We have a pretty good idea of what <laughs> mammals look like, right? I mean, they're pretty pretty abundant today. How could it, how difficult could it be to reconstruct something like an intelodont? And yet we do often see pictures of intelodonts with their teeth really prominent, really bared. Um, Bear in mind that intelodonts are related to things like hippos, and of course hippos have got fantastically big teeth, and yet we can't see any of them when their mouths are closed. So is the picture on the right here maybe a more sensible take on intelodont anatomy, bearing in mind that their close relatives can have all of those fantastic teeth hidden away inside their, inside their mouths. Um, certainly, we underestimate the ability of lips to be covered, uh, sorry, of teeth to be covered by lips, then we do sort of monsterize our <coughs> creatures in that sense. Stylistically, we can also consider um, how that might have a sort of a, a monsterizing effect on things. So I'm going to use Lewis Ray's artwork here because I think Lewis is most closely associated with this sort of very in-your-face style of, of uh, paleo art. And Lewis definitely restores animals. If you talk to Lewis, he's really doing everything he can to restore these things as living beings, not as weird aliens, and not, not as monsters. But by placing the point of view so close to his animals, it does have a distorting effect on their proportions. It does bring them very much into our face. You know, th th they do become this sort of 
intimidatingly close. And so this is a, simply a stylistic choice, which also brings out this slightly monstrous quality to these animals. And you could also say that Lewis is, of course, famous for his coloration of his animals. They are very, very bright. In some cases, they're almost gaudy. And they do, that does give some of them this sort of alien, um, uh, just gives some of them this, this somewhat alien quality. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here because Chris has already given me the halfway sign. So how pervasive is this? If, if that's what monsterization is, and, and a little bit about how we can create it, how pervasive is it? Is it? I think it really depends on the animal. Something like Tyrannosaurus, you know, probably 90% of the re, uh, re, uh, reconstructions of this animal are what we would consider monsterized. They're things like this from Jurassic World, where this thing smashing through. Uh, skeletons and all this sort of stuff to get to people, very, very violent creatures. Other animals, particularly those that don't get restored very often, there isn't very much monsterized uh, paleo art of them. So it really depends what we're talking about, what species we're talking about in terms of how, how monsterized things are. But of course, it's worth pointing out that monsterization is not a new trend at all. We've seen this image several times today, so you know, not going to go into the history uh, of, um, of Dury and Tukor at all. But certainly, you know, from 1830s onward, we have this sort of monsterized prehistory where everything is violent, everything's attacking each other. So this is not a new thing, that's what I'm trying to say. This has been with us for, you know, almost since paleo art was, was conceived in the, uh, in the early 1800s. Um, it's worth stressing that it has not always been, it's probably more dominant today than now than it was in the past. There are lots of pictures of paleo, uh, of, of, pre, of prehistory uh, from the 1800s where things aren't monsterized, but, you know, certainly this has been a major, major subgenre of paleo art history since its very earliest days. And we have to wonder, you know, are there reasons for this? Is there, are there, um, why has monsterization been with us basically since the start? Well, of course, I think we're all familiar with the fact that in the early days of paleontology, we were sort of reconciling the sort of the biblical narrative of, of you know, Earth's history with a scientific one. And of course, early ideas were such that, you know, anything that was prehistoric and primordial, it had to be violent. It had to be, these animals had to be terrible creatures because they're the furthest thing away from man. You know, and we've had this, the idea of progression has come up many times in the workshop. And so things have to start out in this sort of nightmarish, hellish way and then improve as they get towards us. So if we're restoring things that are long, long dead, they had to be violent. And that might, might explain that a little bit for these early 1800s restorations of, of monstrous animals. Over time, this sort of um, theological idea gets replaced with the idea of, of uh, evolution, natural selection, but there's still this kind of bias towards animals that are modern, particularly those that are closer to humans. And I think Charles Knight is a great example of this. Charles Knight is such a fascinating character in paleo art because we have his books, we have his writings, we actually know what he thinks about the animals he's restoring. We don't have that for many classic paleo artists. So we know, for instance, that Charles Knight loved mammals. They were clearly his thing. He loved, loved mammals. When he's talking about things like mammoths or, or proboscideans, we, he's talking, in these quotes here, he's talking about uh, an extant elephant that he visits in the Bronx Zoo. Uh, he really likes this elephant. He talks about her being magnificent and thoroughly ladylike. He really likes mammals. When he's talking about dinosaurs, which of course are older and therefore inferior and more monstrous, he talks about this sort of thing. <laughs> Knight was not that keen on dinosaurs. That's my take on him. I don't think he had, ma maybe he, he liked drawing them, but certainly he did not have a high opinion of them. And so when you look at Knight's work, he does restore dinosaurs in a more, slightly more monstrous way. You know, these are dim-witted, violent, instinct-driven instinct, instinct um, creatures, not like the sophisticated way that he draws mammals, where they're often in herds and with juveniles and this sort of thing. So he, he tackles dinosaurs in a very different way, and they are slightly more monsterized, perhaps because he thought they were evolutionarily inferior to his, uh, his more favorite subjects, the mammals and, and people. And of course, with Knight, we also have to consider this way of monsterizing humans. And this ties into a much bigger picture of his relationship with Osborne, Osborne's, shall we say, choice views on the evolution of humanity, you know, of race and of this sort of thing. And Knight was, in some, reflex, uh, sorry, in some aspects, reflecting some of that in his artwork of things like Neanderthals and aspects like the kind of the, the sloping back of these creatures is influenced by this sort of, uh, this desire of Osborne's to somewhat monsterize, um, somewhat monsterize early humans. Today, the monsterization of prehistory is most prominent in advertising. So we've moved on from this having a, 
a basis in, in religion to a basis in uh, early evolutionary theory. Today, we mostly keep it, we've kind of lost those ideas. We've got a more enlightened view of how evolution works. We don't consider religion too much in our science nowadays. So this really survives because it's useful in advertising. Um, and we see images like this everywhere. I think this is really kind of the legacy of people like uh, Lewis. Lewis Ray has probably popularized this sort of pose more than any other paleo artist. And we now see it <coughs> everywhere. And I do mean everywhere. This kind of lurching, this animal lurching towards us, looking at us as the viewer, um, is, you, is the go-to way of advertising really anything to do <laughs> with prehistory. Um, this didn't take long to find. <laughs> this is just, if you just put dinosaur book into Google, this is what comes up. <laughs> and it, it, it's interesting. So even as a professional paleo artist, when I'm contacted by people, I get asked to do stuff like this. And my, um, the response I don't send out to these people is, do you, do you look at my work? This isn't what I do. Um, <laughs> but th there's this idea of, th there's some, some interesting sort of symbolism, I think, in, in the way these, these animals are depicted. It's the way they're looking at us. Uh, the, it makes the monster in these pictures have a direct relationship with us. And this is something that we didn't see in sort of earlier takes in, uh, in, in monsterized paleo art. Now we are part of this scene because these animals are looking at us. And um, talking to other paleo artists who have been asked to do things like this apparently is essential that they are looking at us, that they're making eye contact with us in these scenes. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting way how we've adapted monsterized paleo art into this sort of more economically driven world now, rather than a sort of philosophical one. And I just wanted to quickly point out, just beyond the world of paleo art, this really chimes in with everything that we say when we're talking in a popular sense about prehistory, when we talk about how ancient animals lived. We, we don't talk about them as real animals. We talk about them reigning and roaming and dominating things. We talk about them living in kingdoms. We, we really give them this very grandiose way of, of, of living. You know, we, we, we don't view them as, as real animals. They're sort of beyond the, 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 the animals that we see today. And of course, this, when you have these narratives combined with, with artwork, the, the two things just feed into each other. And so we, we have pictures of, you know, of, of this sort of thing, these, of these really monstrous animals where the, the words that we ascribe to them perfectly match the monstrous images that we create. And it's just this feedback loop of making these things more and more monstrous. Um, and as I say, they become these sort of super animals. These are things which we know exist. These are real species, but we've turned them into things that are beyond the, cap the, the capabilities and be beyond the anatomy of realistic creatures. And why do we do this? And I, I think it's because in part, it's actually quite difficult. We, dinosaurs are popular, prehistoric animals are popular, and yet they're actually not that great if you're trying to make a film, if you're trying to write a book. Um, animals don't make great characters because animal lives are basically kind of boring. They spend a lot of time sleeping, resting, grooming, uh, waiting around, foraging for little things. You know, they spend a lot of time doing stuff which isn't that exciting. So to use them in our narratives, to use them in comic books and things, we have to make them more exciting. And often the way to do that is to just make them really angry and really aggressive. And I think that's where some of this comes from. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and go through this, this pretty quick. Just to say that, yes, science also has a role to play in this. When we're doing PR for things, I've definitely been asked to monsterize my animals. Maybe not in, that su in, in, such a, uh, in, in, in so many words, but we definitely have had images. So I, I did this about 10 years ago now. I don't think I'd be comfortable drawing uh, a, a creature like this now, because to me, this ticks so many boxes of monsterization. You know, we've really tried to make this. This thing's like about this big. The pterosaur in this, in this, <laughs> this image here, it's a, it's a cute little thing that probably scurried around eating beetles most of the time. And we've got it, you know, deaf from above, coming down here, <laughs> killing baby dinosaurs and stuff. So I, I, w I would probably push back on that now. Uh, a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. Um, we play into this with our um, scientific language. So of course, we now have several prehistoric animals with very overt pop culture references, so things like Zool the Ankylosaur. I'm not, um, not hating on this. I think this is a fantastic dinosaur name. Who doesn't love Ghostbusters, right? So the fact we've got Zool the Ankylosaur, but it, it does kind of fit in with this imagery, th this, this idea of these, of these animals being monstrous. So the big question is, what impact does monsterization have? If this, is this something we need to be worried about? Um, these are all, of course, 
top of the line paleo art restorations. This is exactly what life is like if dinosaurs were be, be, if they were around today. What impact does monsterization have? Obviously, first thing to say, it's not particularly realistic. If paleo art is meant to be depicting um, scientifically credible takes on prehistory, we have to say that visions like this, this is a, a toy Tyrannosaurus, this is not what Tyrannosaurus looks like. This is a, a monsterized version of Tyrannosaurus. It is a failed attempt at paleo art. If we're overly monsterized, or if we're monsterizing things, we're not doing paleo art properly. I think it's worth considering um, the impact this has on paleo art history as a, as a, a sort of a genuine art form. Um, this image here on the left isn't actually anatomically too bad. I think you had something to do with this, Darren. Yeah. Is that correct? There we go. So this is Darren's attempt to make children's books more anatomically accurate, and this is pretty good. So well done, Darren. Yeah. But we have to say that as an art form, no one's going to want that on their wall, whereas a picture like this, a more traditional natural history uh, picture, people would want that on their wall. So monsterizing things, doing these sort of poses, those sorts of extreme anatomical um, restorations, this, uh, you know, it, it, it impacts paleo artistry as an art form, makes it very child skewed, I would say, it makes it, it skews it very young. However, a little bit like what we were saying earlier on in, um, in Susie's talk about plants, we should not look a gift horse in the mouth. Here is that. I think it suits <laughs> the scene pretty well. Um, monsterization does get paleontology out there. So the way we have, um, you know, this kind of advertising for Jurassic World, it keeps things relevant. It means paleontology is in the public eye. That is maybe not something to ta be taken for granted. Um, for me, I think what we need to do is just make sure that pop culture is all over the map in terms of its monsterization index. You know, we have really monstrous things. We have some pop culture which is not very monsterized at all. For us, our scientific media, that's where we need to be. That's what I think our, our goal is. Um, I'm going to use Darren's book as an ex example of this. Science does sometimes get it wrong. Uh, the great story about this book, published by the Natural History Museum, initial cover, thoroughly monsterized, new cover, an interesting take on dinosaur anatomy and you know, an, an appearance. I'm not going to cover that now. Suffice to say, we can, we can do interesting things. We don't have to monsterize stuff to make it interesting, is, is a point we can maybe discuss in a minute or two. Really, the, and the, the, the take home, my, my final point on this is, what impact does monsterization have? Well, I think it has an important one for one of our core messages for popularizing paleontology. We are teaching, uh, we we're trying to communicate the story of life on Earth. This is a little bit like what I was saying in the, the event last night. We're talking about the story of life from the very beginnings of the planet to the modern day. If we populate that with monsters, that story is broken because I cannot imagine this creature living on this planet. It doesn't look like it belongs here. This animal does. And if you start telling me about extinction and about uh, the, the, if you start telling me about how animals adapt to change and how climate change and things influences things, this is something I can relate to. That looks like an animal that I could believe lived here and has gone extinct because of, 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 of these impacts that, that, you know, that we can have and that, that have affected the planet in the past. And I think that's a, that's a core message. If we monsterize the past too much, it becomes unbelievable and this message that we've got gets lost. And thanks very much.